Dr. Kim, thank you for coming on the Big Believer podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what unfolds between the two of us today. Uh, One place I would love to just jump off with is a little bit of your past and specifically your transition away from traditional medicine to something way more unknown, probably way scarier. I, 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 I'm very interested in people that make these pivots in life, whatever it may be, um, where they realize something's not working and they have a calling for something else. And it may not be popular. It may not be what their parents wanted them to do, but they have this calling. And I, I see that in you and specifically in traditional medicine, there's so much identity. I feel like wrapped up in there. There's a doctor in the beginning of your name. There's, there's schooling, there's, I'm an expert in this field and it's very well regarded. There's, you know, um, so for you to transition to something, um, not as traditional, not as conventional, I find that very interesting. And what I would just love to learn a little bit about is what that transition was like for you. How did you possibly have the confidence and courage to, to transition away from something so stable and acclaimed and and all that, all that comes with that to something way more unknown, but sounds like you were following your heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And I think, you know, one of the things that maybe people could assume is like you said, it's a stable thing and you're doing great. And how can you um, leave and go on a different trajectory? Um, But the, the reality was like being so sensitive and so aware emotionally, I was really suffering in that, in that job. And I knew like, there's an expiration point here. Um, I also sort of had the benefit of like, and I think everyone has this on some level that there was a time where you had more of that purity of heart of like, I want to really make a difference in the world, like your true self, your true calling, maybe not as explicitly as I did, which I can talk about in a sec. But, um, I think everyone had, like, we started out with the intention for like a fulfilling career, really making a difference. And then I think when we end up in a situation where it's kind of flat, we've got to go back to like, wait a minute, what, what, where's my why? And that will give us a lot of strength and courage to like create a rearrangement for me. Um, you know, I knew at a young age that, um, I was here to like help people get in their body, get more fully in their body with, consciousness with presence and that that was what would allow the body to heal and that along that trajectory was um, going to medical school becoming a doctor and that kind of path but I actually still had the awareness like I was in that world but not of it like I knew there was ultimately something more expansive for me and so after like a few years of full-time ER and, and I decided to do an ER residency because that just made a lot of sense like I'm not here to learn about how to, you know, push you along with diabetes for an extra 20 years and Mm. and just barely keep you, you know, going. I wasn't remotely interested in learning that kind of like, um, you know, that kind of medical management, but in ER, it's like, well, great, your arm is off. We can put your arm back on. We can give you medicine. That's going to prevent you from dying. But, but I knew there was more to the equation. So I knew if I were going to be in the allopathic system, that that's a place that was really um, made a lot of sense to me. Like we're, we're doing uh, the right thing. We're using medicine in a rational way, as opposed to like, sometimes we go to that field of medicine for something it's not designed for. Um, so after a couple of years of full-time ER, I kind of knew like, all right, where's my path? This was my stepping stone. This was a a part of my journey, but this is not my end point. And I I started feeling restless and also um, the pain of like staying where I was, where, you know, I would take a vacation, but I'd come back and be like, just as miserable, like, oh no, how am I going to make this work? I got to get through another month before I have another vacation. (laughs) I got to pull this off. So I was like really, really aware of my misery, I guess, you know, that like, this is not my world. This is not where I'm meant to function. Um, I know I'm not going to survive this. And so I started just asking like, okay, God, um, where's my life? We, when are we going to get the show on the road? And, um, and I just kept hearing like, kind of like be still and no, it's all coming, be anxious for nothing. Mm. 
let it come to you. And then it would crop up again. And I'd be like, oh my God, what, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll go knock on doors and find some space to rent and, and do some healing work. And, and it was like, nope, be anxious for nothing. It's coming to you. And it was, I don't know how long, like maybe a couple months, a few months that I uh, found, you know, that an opportunity presented itself. And I knew like, yep, this is my next step. So I think staying open, but also being willing to choose and being willing to make changes and being willing to choose my highest, being willing to choose what was really in my heart. And then, you know, I went to an osteopathic medical school. So there were a lot of people who were doing really powerful healing arts and like healing people doing amazing work. So I had a template for that. What is osteopathic? So osteopathic is um, where we learn more about how the mind and body are connected, how mm. the body heals itself, how the physical uh, and the emotional are interrelated. And, um, you know, it wasn't the exact template for what I was here to do. I was here to do it in my own way, um, which, I, you know, we've got to create our own path. We got to create our own thing. But I also had the awareness that like, there's another way to do this. There's another possibility. And I think for most people who are on that allopathic route, which is what I ultimately did with my, my residency for trauma and critical care and what I was doing with my, my career, um, most of them didn't have any kind of foundation for anything else. So it was like, well, what else would I even do? This is what I have to do. This is the only possibility. And I think it behooves always to, it behooves all of us to, to ask um, what else is possible that maybe I don't already know. Because if the heart is asking for something else and telling you like, no, I don't want to be doing this job anymore. I don't want to be doing this relationship anymore. We may not understand how it's possible to have it be different, but if we just kind of ask, we're going to be shown. So, so what I'm hearing, and you, you, you hit on a couple of really interesting points in that in-between phase, it sound, you said, be anxious for nothing is what you heard, which is really interesting. And I'd love to hear more about how that was practiced for you, but also to ask, maybe we don't see the whole picture. You were convinced that your path was sort of this finite thing, that there was nothing else. And you were invited to be like, wait, maybe I don't know the whole picture. And so that, that patience, that openness, that what else is possible for me seemed to really change things for you. And also, and also, I, I also hear it wasn't a perfectionist mindset. Like you were, you osteopathic may not have been the A plus hundred percent knock it out of the ballpark, but it was getting closer to what you wanted. So those three things sort of just like patience, openness. And once a step comes to you, it may not be exactly what you have in your mind, but take it anyway. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And you know, like Part of that really was deep listening. So when I would ask, when I would imagine like, I'm going to go door to door and just find somewhere to have an osteopathic practice or do something meaningful. And I would feel the like, you know, that, that tension in that I'd feel like <laughs> scampering around, trying to make it work, trying to knock on doors. I'll do anything. I felt the frequency of that was kind of more of the same. It was like, that's not your joy, Kim. Mm -hmm. That's not your path because you know, the journey equals the destination. So if I were to take a path of like, I'll do anything, let me find my way. Like I'm only going to create more chaos. And so I had to really honor that listening of like, be anxious for nothing and like honor that stillness and let that guide me instead. And so when I chose that path, which very often there's nothing to do, you're kind of like <laughs> the timing's coming in, just keep cultivating that presence of peace. And then like you get a phone call or the door opens and that that's what happened for me. Sometimes I'll have that sense and then I'll have an inspiration for making a phone call or doing an action. But either way, it came as a result of, of grounding into that piece, not trying to scamper and, and make things change. So that deep listening that was just a huge part. I could feel the, the difference between the frequency of like trying to knock down doors versus like the calm stillness of like, be still and no, it's coming to you all is well. And you know, that ultimately is what happened because I, I spoke to a colleague 
who was in an osteopathic practice. She had gone that route and I had done this other thing. And I started feeling so jealous, like what the hell am I doing? I'm in this, you know, trauma bay and I'm miserable. And I should have just done like what she did and taken the safe route um, and just, you know, created an osteopathic practice. And I'd be, I'd be happy like she is. And which, you know, it's not true, but <laughs> I, I said how, um, you know, she bought this person's practice who had a really prominent practice up in Maine. And when I was a medical student, he took care of me. He's this amazing guy. I said, well, where did Greg go if you bought his practice? And she said, oh, he went to Tennessee to start a new osteopathic medical school. They're building a new medical school there. Well, I had done lots of teaching. I'd done a fellowship that was like a teaching fellowship. Um, I knew they were going to want me if they found out like I was in Atlanta. Hey, it's not far from Tennessee. Maybe I'll drive up once in a while. This is awesome. And I was like, how do I get in touch with him? I don't have his number anymore. And um, she's like, oh, I'll let, I'll let him know. You know, the next day I get a call and he, Greg, the, the head of one of the heads of the program, he's like, what do we have to do to get you here? Mm. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, where exactly are you? And I realized it was like four and a half hours away. This was not going to be some like minor involvement that I have on the side as a way to like keep my regular gig going, but give me a little breath of fresh air once in a while. This was going to be like a major life change where I would sell my home that I loved, you know, leave my life. And then I started thinking like, I like my life. I'm making lots of money. I have all my friends. I'm in the city. I'm in Atlanta. I'm living the cool life. And it was like this little blip. And it was, I just realized like, nope, Kim, that's not what we're doing. Mm. So I sold, I sold my house. I moved. I mean, I literally just scheduled the appointment with the realtor like the next week and drove up there to look at real estate. Cause I knew like, this is what we're doing. Nothing was more important than my serenity. So like, even though I had good friends and I was kind of having a good time, it didn't overcompensate for the emptiness in my heart and that sense of like desperation. So I knew like, yeah, no, that's, that's not what we're doing. I'm, I'm going. And um, I just felt it. I felt like this is your path. We're move, making this move. And I, um, you know, and it was the next step. It wasn't where I am now, which is more of the full fruition of things, but it was definitely way more expansive. It was an awesome next step. I integrated a lot and worked with Greg and learned a lot. And I changed, like it changed who I was, even just the buzz of, you know, I drove back from that weekend and it was up in the hills in Tennessee. And there was like farms and cows and stuff. And then I drove back into the buzz of Atlanta and I literally felt the buzz, like as if the whole city was vibrating. I'm driving through like, you know, seven lanes of traffic back to my house, which is in like the, the center of the city. And I realized, oh my God, I've been living in this buzz. No wonder I've been miserable. No wonder I, I don't feel connected or clear. Um, what am I doing here? So that move, you know, brought me to a space where there was, um, you know, whenever there's more peace, more of your stuff comes up, right? You can't hide from it. Yeah. So it was like a really cathartic, like two and a half year transition into being more grounded, more grounded as a, as an individual, as a, as a, you know, authentic being who doesn't just think about deep listening, but is like living it every day. And it just practiced me into who I needed to be to do, you know, the next thing and to do ultimately what I'm doing now. Yeah. And, you know, I can relate to part of your journey where, you know, a few years ago I was doing a fine, I was in a finance career, climbing the corporate ladder, doing these things. And it wasn't even a strenuous, crazy job, but I remember coming home and having to just lie on my bed for a half an hour to just decompress uh, this pounding headache I had. And it, it really didn't equate because it was the best job I ever had. I was traveling the globe for my job. It was, you know, my grandparents and everybody was proud of me. It was a fancy title, making a lot of money. And, and to your point, it just, the, the logic that my mind was saying, yeah, this is good. This is good. This is what you want to be doing was not matching. You called it a frequency. What the truth of what's in here was not matching what my mind was telling me. Yeah, this is good. Just be grateful for this. And, and so I, you know, I left everything behind too and moved to Colorado for a bit. And, you know, I'm not quite at a level where I can say, yeah, it was all worth it and everything. Um, Cause it's brought up, as you said, a lot in me, 
but I can resonate with that. Whatever is going on on the outside, whatever image you're trying to portray is not what's matching inside. And, and I just love how you, it sounded like your guidepost was just, um, instead of efforting your way to figuring out what was next, that, that frequency that doesn't feel as high, as expansive, as peaceful, as you said, your serenity was sort of priority number one, which is such a different way of making decisions in our culture is, is following that higher frequency. And even if that means staying where you are and, and not, not efforting your way out, I just, I can, I can resonate very strongly. And, um, you know, that really seems like, um, just, a, just a beautiful way to, to move forward. Even if you don't know where you're going is that guidepost of how does this really feel like uh, exhausting myself? Yeah. That's seems like an outdated way to sort of make decisions and, um, and actually feeling what's in there, even if it's painful, even if it's tough to be with, you can, you can kind of feel that it, it just, it, it just feels differently. It's the only way I can describe it. Yeah, It feels more expansive, yeah. even if it brings up pain or stuff you wanted to hide from and your own feelings of inadequacy or uncertainty, doubt, it, mm. it still feels expansive. Like it still feels like something's happening and moving in the right direction. And actually when we do choose our own expansion, that's what often happens is like all the stuff that mm, was keeping us stuck is now dislodged and we'll feel it. So don't make that wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And one of the things I know, so if you can, if we can kind of keep going with this. Um, so you're an osteopath, osteopathic now, and it's obviously more expansive than where you were. I love the, the visual of you driving back to your old life and just, oh my God, I must've been used to this, but this does not feel good anymore. I remember um, after being in Colorado, going back to the loop in downtown Chicago, and I felt like I was kind of entering back into the matrix and everyone was in suits and rushing around and I didn't have a job at the time, but I wasn't comparing myself to them anymore. It was more like, this just doesn't feel right to me anymore. And no judgment for anybody that lives that life. But for me, it was that stark difference too. So so you being an osteopathic now, kind of more on your path, how did you start to um, learn the skills or just maybe through life experience, get to a place where you are now with what you're teaching with um, the American Institute of Mind-Body Activation Medicine? Okay, so um, we got to go back sort of to way before medical school and something that was like my awakening experience where at 16 years old, you know, I'd already been very empathic and sensitive, but I used uh, marijuana with my boyfriend or smoke, smoke some marijuana. And it like opened all the floodgates of perception in a massive way, in a way that was like really, really unsettling. Ultimately it was a gift, but it was a really hard experience to go through and um, had just greatly enhanced perceptual awareness. So I could hear people think I could feel what they were feeling. I could be aware of things that linearly you wouldn't be aware of, like what's going on with someone else that, you know, you're just not even there. Um, and I was really freaked out because I didn't understand what to do with that. and didn't understand what's happening. And then all the fear, you know, like you get what you focus on created a lot of chaos. So it was kind of a tumultuous experience. And one, um, I actually had a really hard time ever explaining to anyone until I learned more about when people would use um, psychedelics to like have an ayahuasca journey and create an awakening. And I was like, well, damn, that's exactly what happened. It was like an ayahuasca journey, except it was just marijuana. And I didn't have a shaman there. I didn't have a clue what was going on. You know, you do ayahuasca. It's very awakening, but you like know that something's going to happen. <laughs> you have a guide spiritually. Well, I was, you know, raised in a, a Catholic family. And the only context I had for anything spiritual was like, you know, the devil or, you know, God and the devil. And so I was like, am I being possessed because I did this bad thing? There's so much judgment of, you know, you're not supposed to use drugs. And I just thought like, oh, I screwed up my life. I did this thing I shouldn't do. And now kind of like I ate of the forbidden fruit and now I'm fucked forever. And that was a scary thought. And so, yeah, what you focus on expands. Imagine 
you know, focusing on that thought. And, and I had panic attacks and anxiety disorder. And I also felt super isolated. There was nobody I could talk to. I, I tried to talk to the priest. I ended up getting sent oh. like the mental ward. Cause I was like, you know, we get, this person is psychotic. Wow. It was really, and it, it was also like a mental breakdown. So it wasn't like it was normal to anybody around me. And uh, you know, that try to medicate me and use therapy and all this stuff that I realized, like, this is really just, um, well, it would, it would make me feel snowed. It wasn't helping the anxiety. Um, I realized like, I've got to get out of this. I've got to fly under the radar to get off these medications. And like, nobody's going to kind of catch me anymore. And I'm going to figure this out when I figure this out, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have to get under the radar until I find someone who could actually be uh, a spiritual guide or could give me a clue about what's going on. I had um, a book that the psychiatrist gave me to read the road less traveled, which is moderately spiritual. I mean, compared to a lot of stuff that you might be reading now, it, it's kind of a starter, but at the time it was like the most awakening book. And I was like, Whoa, other people are reading this book. It says it's a bestseller. There's a person who wrote this book. Mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. I can connect with other like-minded people, I could probably really figure this out and, and, and set myself free and have some tools. And, uh, that was my one little glimmer of hope. So it was like, all right, Kim, hold it together, fly under the radar. We're going to learn everything we can. And when we're in a place where we can really unpack this, that's where we're going. And so I was on my own. And with all of the anxiety, like I learned that what I was thinking about affected my body, how I was breathing affected how I would feel. Um, and so I started to kind of teach myself or, or just learn from my body about mind body medicine and about uh, how to focus on, you know, peace and harmony, how to shift my breathing so I could recalibrate um, how to meditate, although I would never have called it that. Um, how to use a mantra, or I would have never called it that. So I just developed that by being present to what was happening in me and um, really found my way to realize, whoa, a lot of the things we think are going on in the body are not about illness and wrongness and you're broken and you quote, have a disease. It's more about the body responding to us, our thoughts, our emotions, our perspective, and either becoming inflamed and developing disease or, you know, being in serenity and exhibiting health. And then all this whole universe of medicine was just really like the surface idea of that whole underworld of what was really happening. And so with that insight, I knew I want to learn, I want to become a doctor, and I want to teach and share this insight and this truth from the perspective of a medical doctor who could really guide people in the right direction about here's how your body can heal. Here's how we assist the body in healing. Here's why disease is not a wrongness and it's not a thing that happened to you. It's a process you're in and your body's giving you feedback here. How can you be a different being so the body can show up in more harmony and exhibit health? You know, who do I need to be? I need to be not afraid, not controlling, not contracting. I need to be an allowance of myself. I need to be in forgiveness. I need to be in self-approval. And so I would see my body respond to that. And, um, and, you know, I just realized like, well, this is a really profound truth and wisdom that I want to learn and bring forth in the world of medicine. So that kind of download happened at a, at a really young age. And that's like what even inspired me to go into medicine and learn. I read everything I get my hands on about mind, body, medicine and spirituality and like anatomy and the body. And so I was already on my own path before I got on like their path mm -hmm. with like the medical system. And I think that really allowed me to be in that world, but not of it um, by the grace of God that, you know, I kept that spark and having gone to an osteopathic medical school instead of an allopathic medical school, because that didn't come later until residency, really was my saving grace. Um, even though I, I applied to allopathic medical schools, I'd never heard of an osteopathic medical school. And then I, you know, I didn't get in from my undergraduate. So it was two years later, I now learned about this other thing. And it was like, ding, 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 ding. And, and I think that having that extra layer of support and like mentorship because 
a lot of osteopathic medical schools are really all mel melted in with the allopathic. It's kind of all the same. We do the same boards and we go to the same residency mm. and we do the same exams. But I thankfully went and had some mentorship by some people who really knew what they were doing and had a grasp of like the real medicine of healing. And it just it fed me enough that going through that whole process, um, I stayed connected. And I am inspired by the fact that you had this awakening experience and then you taught yourself kind of feedback. Like when I think this and believe this and act this way, my body reacts that way. And, and for you to keep that flame alive, going into a completely different world where that isn't talked about and still have it in you to enough that, that glimmer of hope that there's something to this that I'm not really seeing in the outside world. Um, I'm really inspired by that because um, so many of us I know can feel hopeless and lost and, and hear this and feel it and believe it and then go out in the world and it, it becomes yeah. so far away. Um, and, and one of the reasons I, I love, um, hearing you speak is you have this way of, you know, a, a traditional way of relating to the body is again, I have this disease. I have this depression. It won't go away. It's this fixed thing. There's something broken, but whenever I hear you speak, it's like this, it's like our bodies are this malleable thing. It, it can change really fast. And and it's something that we have control over, which is just something I've never heard before and not a way I traditionally relate to my body, my mind, everything like that. But the fact that it's like you can almost mold it out of clay almost, it feels like. And, and that to me, when I hear you speak about this is very empowering. And that's the thing that we found about the body that is kind of the best kept secret, I guess, because it, you know, it usually takes like over 20 years for some new understanding to get integrated into like mainstream medicine, at mm. least 20 years. Um, and so to understand like, whoa, our cells are listening. Whoa, our DNA is changing depending on like what we focus on. And, and I think this is the, the most important thing to remember is what I focus on expands. And so when I was in my residency and it was a very allopathic world, I was the only DO in the emergency medicine program that year. I was the first one in that particular program. And um, I did have like a few friends who would come to me to give them a treatment, to, to do the healing work. And it was only once in a while, but I knew that was there and I kept my attention on that. And so even though I was enmeshed in this other world where that seems non-existent, I was grateful. Like it was still, I had enough of a little nugget that it, it kept getting me through that I could keep this part alive. And I think it's really true. Like, um, when you said, I don't think I've gotten to the part of my life where it's all worth it. Yeah. If we actually begin to look at, well, how, where are the little nuggets where it has been worth it? Or where are the little nuggets where I am grateful this, for this journey? And you can look at like, well, it led me to create a podcast to share with others and open my heart and, and be more transparent. Um, it, it, it gave me more compassion for like people who have hardship, right. And strife. And like, wow, I I'm going mm -hmm. through something, maybe letting go of that money and that income had you have to trust yourself on a different level. And so if, if I can think of 10 reasons, I'm grateful for this thing that doesn't seem to be worth it. I'm going to keep that, um, spark because what I focus on expands. And so we can't create in our life what we don't already have. Like if I were in this drudgery and I'm like, I want to create this other thing, but it's separate and it's not here. It, it can't happen. But if I look for little sparks in my life where like life is on my side, life is magical. Life is happening for me. There are good things about where I am. I can create more of that abundance. I can create more of that little spark of gratitude or joy. And that's what I think is the most important part of the journey is, well, what if I look for how it is worth it, even though your mind could say like, yeah, I'm not there yet. Wait a minute. Let's pause on that. H how is it freaking awesome? Mm. And you come up with 10 ways that it actually is awesome. Like I met this person or I did this thing, or I had this experience. Uh, I became more courageous in the mind. Those might seem little, little nothings, but in an energetic, they're really potent and they're powerful nuggets that are a template for more spark to come in. So you said for the mind, it seems like nothing, which is totally true. 
um, I'd get tremendous feedback from my mind saying, this does nothing. This is stupid. This, this you're tired. This is just like more energy for you to, to put out. But what you're saying is there's something energetically that's actually responding to that. Um, yes. There's the template of your life is responding that. And the template of your life will keep showing like, blah, like, Oh, I only got two people listening to my podcast. See, it's not worth it. It's always going to prove you right. But if yes. you're like, oh, let me be creative. Wait a minute. What about this? What about this? And you start stirring the energy of that, um, that magic and you, you notice little nuggets anyway, then you're going to see that show up on the, the movie screen. There was, I heard you speak a couple months ago. Um, I'm not sure if you'll remember saying this, but it was very, very powerful to me. You were talking about, um, I think it was a quote by Albert Einstein, basically saying one of the most powerful questions we can ask is, is this universe friendly? And you were talking about how your, your answer to that is really important. And, and the most courageous and self-loving thing you could do is even if you don't see any evidence for it, feel any evidence for it, believe any evidence for it, saying yes anyway is just, it's it, the only reason you do it is because it feels better than hardening up and saying no, and this isn't for me. And just for that. And I found that really empowering. And again, bringing it back to gratitude, that feels the same way that even if you don't see any evidence, search for it anyway, because yes. it does feel better when I'm in that state. It just yes. does. Search for it anyway, because it feels better and search for it anyway, because that's the template that your life is being created from. And so if you activate yourself like 10, 10 grats a day of why it actually is worth it. And you tell yourself, Dustin, here's what is worth it about taking this journey. Here's what is worth it about the path I'm on right now today. You, I mean, we know neuroplastic changes happen in the brain, but the way I've understood it is that is the receptivity for that new truth. It is a receptivity to see where that absolutely is true. When we're in the old arrangement, it's like, yeah, nah, this isn't worth it. And I'm totally right about that. And you'll have like, you could probably have a thousand things you could say right now that support that, but you only need a few little nuggets to begin to shift that, that inner frequency, that inner energy. And your life is being created from that template, from your, you know, the frequency of your system, the sum of the, the parts, not your, you know, your consciousness you know, your conscious intention, right? The consciousness is like, I can do it. It's going to be great. But then your subconscious, like I, I'm a total loser. I'll never make it. Your, your reality is going to be created from the sum of all the, all the parts. But if you begin to shift that little by little by little, you're shifting your point of, um, you call it your point of attraction. You're shifting your vibrational frequency. You're actually creating electromagnetic shifts, which we can measure medically up to eight to 10 feet from the body. Your body is setting off an electromagnetic field. You're creating cellular hormonal chemical shifts of just the signals and transmitters and all of those uh, communication system in the body. And you're creating changes in your neural pathways, you actually light up different areas of the brain and you sort of like dissolve old neural pathways of all the failures. And here's why you can't do it. Or the programs that you grew up with that, uh, sort of begins to shift and morph. So now you're in a new neural pathway of empowerment and success. And what I've seen is you now begin to have the thoughts to have the awareness and insight that you couldn't have accessed before. Mm. So you're saying a little bit of gratitude every day. You said 10, I've heard you say 17 seconds begins to shift it somehow. Yes. Um, it, it affects the energy you're putting out, the electromagnetic energy that your body's putting out. It affects your cell structure and your neural pathways in your brain. Yes. That doesn't seem like a whole lot to start to make some changes. That's really interesting. Well, Institute of Heart Math um, has a lot of research where they're studying this. And so if we hold a, a thought, so Dustin, I want you to just say, um, what if it has been all worth it? What if it has been all worth it? All right. And then just put your hand on your heart and say, on some level, maybe I'm not feeling it right now. On some level, there's possibility for me. On some level even though I might not be feeling it right now, there's possibility for me. 
And then say, what if I welcome in that possibility? What if I welcome in that possibility? Okay, now just breathe that in. So this is the 17 seconds. You're just percolating in a new energy, a new possibility, a new idea. That's an electromagnetic shift, right? Every thought has an electromagnetic vibration. And so now those 17 seconds, that's how long it takes for the electromagnetic shift to actually create a chemical shift. Like, did you start to feel a little lighter I by did. the end of that? <laughs> okay. So yeah. hormones, you know, um, receptor sites are changing, uh, neurochemicals are starting to, you know, we have oxytocin, endorphins, and your body's like, ooh, this feels good. So you go from the electromagnetic shift, which is instant, to an actual physiologic shift, which can take a moment. Now, you stay in that new physiology long enough, you're going to change your cells, you're going to change your DNA, and you're going to change your brain firing and brain patterns. But it's like, I've got to put energy into this practice first. And so it takes a little energy to make those changes because I'm going to be like, I don't feel like doing my grads. Life sucks, but I'm going to do them anyway. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't feel like it, let me just see what's possible. Let me just practice because I made a commitment. So now you devote yourself and now you put energy into something higher than maybe what I used to do, like get up in the morning and I'm going to check my email. Now I get up in the morning and I do my gratitudes. And, and I don't just say like, I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for my home. I go to the why. I'm grateful that my kids are here and we have so much fun together and the home is alive. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for our home because it supports all of us. Like we connect here. We have friends here. We work here. It's so supportive. So now I can feel it. You feel that like vibration of that grat, uh, that gratitude. Um, you've got to do it to like feel the shift mm -hmm. because that's what ignites the system into a changed state. And it's okay to kind of play along, even though some part of you is like, this is crazy. This doesn't work. This isn't going to do anything. This isn't what you really believe. Yeah. yeah. In fact, what I'll do in that instance is I'll write that, like I'll swamp it all out, get swampy and muddy and dirty and be in the mucky <laughs> shit. I hate my life. It'll never work. Um, just, it's just thoughts. And, but mm. I'll write them down and be like, all right, here's the shit floating around in my system. And I'll just hold it to my heart and say, I love you. You're yeah. welcome to be here. It's okay for you to be here because now I'm in a frequency that's higher than the stuff. Mm. I can be in a frequency that's higher than the stuff when I write it down and notice it. When I say, you're welcome to be here in my body today. It's okay that you're here. I'm in a way higher frequency because a, a frequency of allowing and non-resistant is higher than a frequency of anger, fear, shame, and resistance. I, I love that because I can notice myself getting into a trap of I'm writing my gratitudes. I'm hearing these thoughts, these negative thoughts, not right now. I'm doing my gratitude. And what you're saying is actually write those down, invite them. And you're welcome here too. You're allowed to be here during my yeah. gratitude practice. You can say I'm grateful. I hear this shitty thought because for 40 years of my life, it was unconscious, but still driving the plane, you know, running the show. Yeah. Cause that thought was in the driver's seat. And now you're observing it and you're in the driver's seat. So you could say, I'm grateful to notice all this crap that kind of got passed down unconsciously in my system. Mm. And, and I've also heard you say for the first time I've ever heard it is awareness is the medicine. Is that sort of what you're talking about that you're just sort of non-judgmentally aware of whatever is occurring, good or bad? Yes. Yes. Would you be so bold and courageous? to do that, right? To just let it be here. Most people fight it. They suppress it with everything they've got. No, I don't feel ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I don't feel inadequate. I'm good. I got my job. I got my thing. I feel good. But the universe of everything in their system is completely unacknowledged. And so to have the courage to look at like, whoa, what's actually here? Are there ideas, thoughts, feelings um, in my system that maybe I do feel inadequate. Maybe I do sometimes feel scared. You're at a way higher frequency when you begin to acknowledge that. Now you might feel um, more uncomfortable, sure. but the, the, the secret trick is like, those thoughts are creating your life anyway. Whether you like don't acknowledge them and you're like, I'm good, I'm great. They're creating the obstacles. They're creating the limitation. They're creating that things aren't working out. And so- you're more powerful when you acknowledge them and welcome them, even though you're a little less comfortable or maybe a lot less comfortable, yeah. but it's only when we do that, that we let them breathe and we let them move out. 
So now I'm breathing the whole space of all the shit that's here. I'm airing it out. I'm letting it move. And it will. Like, that's what your breath does. That's what your system does. It transmutes that energy. So being in the awareness will feel like, oh no, now I'm really in a problem. I'm aware how much stuff is in here. Yeah. And you might judge yourself like, whoa, I'm more messed up than I thought. <laughs> but that's the vantage point of power. Whoa, now that I'm really seeing the density that I didn't acknowledge before, I, I can take just a few breaths. Even if I only do a few because it's so intense, I'm moving some of it. Maybe I move 2% of it. But now I'm at a higher, clearer vantage point for wisdom, for wealth, for health, for love to come into my life. So that that movement, however subtle it is when you are aware of it, is that that's the medicine that allows for lighter energy to, to come in in its place? Is that, is that lighter energy saying? and also like stuff happening? Like I remember when Kyle mentioned, um, oh, this this guy, Dustin Stern, and then you reached out. And I, I, you know, I had a million reasons, like I can't add this in, but I felt like a spark of like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely do this. And then we had to cancel. And I was like, I'm putting this on my, you know, I wasn't going to just be like, I'm sick. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I'm too busy for you. Change of mind. Like I had the awareness, like we're doing this and it's not convenient, but it was, um, real. Like I felt a spark of like, we're doing this. And so you're inviting in um, possibilities in your life, people to contribute to what you're doing, right? Even if I'm not consciously aware, like, uh, what am, why am I doing this? But I knew it was a yes. You're welcoming in factors and occurrences and circumstances that otherwise would not happen. There's a million reasons why it wouldn't happen. And so if you've started to spark into the like, what if I do believe in myself? Even though I'm sure I'm a loser, what if I do believe in myself, even though I'm sure there's no way things could happen, you're choosing your yes. And that's what creates your life. And that's what people respond to, whether they say yes or say no, it's hundred percent dependent on your frequency. And there's wow. something special about you. Like you have a lot of courage, but you also have a lot of um, transparency. Like you're doing this with your heart. You're doing this for yourself. You're doing this to love yourself and share that with other people who are going to benefit from listening. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I, I really appreciate you letting me know about that. And, and what I'm hearing is by, by doing this work a little bit day by day, the, the, the things that resonate to you may not make complete sense on a, uh, on a mind level, but you feel it and and, and that allows for space to actually trust that more and to move from that place more. And, and that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yes. And then miracles happen stuff that it was like, that's not going to happen. It happens. And, and there's a lot more in store when you keep percolating in this, you're going to see, because what you've seen is um, what gets created from your not activated self. Like maybe yes. there's not tons of flow or money or opportunities, yeah. but you haven't really seen what gets created from your activated self. So if you do even just like a gratitude practice or you do the instant elevation tool, if you know how I teach people to drop into the body, you're going to see what gets created from your activated self. So it really doesn't matter that it seems impossible from the unactivated self. When you activate, it's like you put the light in the lighthouse. Everyone can see you. Everyone mm. can respond. And for those of us that want to start a gratitude practice or start to understand this awareness as medicine and drop in more. And, um, I know that perfectionist mindsets take over and I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing this correctly. What would you say to people like that to stay on anyway, even if it's a little bit every day? I, I yeah. And that's really why when I wrote the mind body toolkit, um, my book, th this, this is the stuff I learned. There are like little tiny nuggets, little tiny. All right. I can do that while I'm online at the grocery store. I can connect with my body this way while I'm driving my car. I can shift my breathing this way while I'm, you know, speaking or in an important conversation. It's nuggets, little nuggets, but it's the, you know, small shifts, small shifts in consciousness that make big shifts physically, physiologically, and in your external circumstances. Mm. So I would say like, you know, soften your shoulders and let your breath come into your belly 
and just feel your body. So just, hi body, how are you? Here we are. This is the first step of the instant elevation. You just aware. So you go from like, maybe you feel good, like I'm good, everything's good, but you're not dropped into your body. So you're not really aware. And it might seem like that's better, but I'm, I promise you like that's gonna create cancer. <laughs> it's gonna create autoimmune disease. It's gonna create, you don't have any money or you have to work your ass off or like barely having enough. Like that's just not gonna create real and being fed. And if you just um, soften your shoulders, take a deep breath and then let go and just feel your body. Hey body, how are you? What's here? You're gonna feel stuff but it's moving. The only reason you feel it is because it's moving. So it's like all the densities start moving out, moving out, you're becoming lighter. So even if you just do that one thing and, you know, set your alarm on your phone to go off that you practice it five times a day, little body check-in, shift your breathing. Hey body, how are you? Presence your body. So that I call that the drop-in and you're going to get better at it. So just maybe be shitty at it for a while like i don't feel anything nothing's happening okay i love you i'm gonna do it anyway maybe i will feel something the fifth or sixth time because you're changing your neural pathways you're beginning to pay attention to different information and so those sensations will begin to come in and that guidance will begin to come in and i, I love that i i I've, I've noticed that people have such a hard time being a beginner um and it's yeah. just hard but to let our let ourselves struggle and try and not do the best. But you also say like, you always say 1%, um, which is a very low, I love the low bars you said, because that's, that helps us start to, okay, I can do it for 17 seconds, or I can try to get, to get a little bit more movement, maybe 1%. That just really helps. And yeah. Um, and it's going to be uncomfortable for 17 seconds. Like if, if I'm going to go swim in the pool I'm like, oh, I don't want to get in the pool. You have a state change. I'm dry and Ooh, I'm going to be wet. Yeah. And then like, same thing. Oh, I don't want to get out of the pool. It's going to be cold. You're going to have a state change. The, I hate that, right? But you do it anyway. Do the state change and put energy in for 17 seconds. You're going to see massive payoff. Beautiful. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for joining us and, and for your wisdom and your energy and um. One, yeah. Well, again, one of the reasons I love uh, hearing you speak is just you, you inspire change your enthusiasm for this stuff um, makes it like, Hey, wait a minute. I, I want to give this a try, even if it's just a little bit every day. And I'm just grateful for everything you do. And just real quick, where can people find you and your work for those that want to learn more? I'm at drkimd.com. Um, so they can go to the site and subscribe. And I do a weekly live broadcast called Mind Body TV every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Mountain. It's live, um, but it's recorded. It's on my YouTube channel at Dr. Kim Duramo. Or if you're in Facebook, uh, we're in the Mind Body Community group in Facebook. So we will, we will can go there. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just I feel really grateful you're sharing this with others because I think people are going to learn a lot from you. And you know, if you um, just be really easy on yourself, you're going to see magic. Like you have so much in you and you're going to do great things. So just be super, super loving with yourself and light with yourself. And um, you'll see a lot of things come out. So mm -hmm. I think that's for everybody listening, but you know, you can start practicing it and you'll see who you are. Uh, I love, I love the pep talk. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for your persistence in getting this conversation to happen. And I'm just, I really appreciate you. And yeah, thank you for coming on Dr. Kim.